I want you to cast your minds back to when you went on holiday in the late 1990s or early 2000s. What sort of things would you bring with you? Well, you'd need your flip phone to make calls and texts, your iPod or CD player to listen to music, a camera to take pictures, a map so you wouldn't get lost, and your credit or debit card so that you could pay for things. Essentially, items that will make your trip possible. Now, flash forward to the present day. Which of these items would you still bring with you on holiday? Well, wouldn't it be easier to just bring your smartphone? It condenses all of those functions into one device. You can call or text people, listen to music, take pictures, use it as a sat-nav, and pay for things contactlessly, all in one place. The advancements being made in modern technology are helping to take so many aspects of our lives and put them all into one place, making it easier for us to do day-to-day -day tasks and increasing our productivity in work environments. It's not just smartphone technology though. Take for example, online streaming services, placing all the TV shows and films you could ever want to watch into one place online, which can be easily accessed 24 seven. You don't need to have access to a DVD player you can just watch a film on your smart device like that. And the advancements in online cloud storage mean that files take up a lot less space on your phone or computer as they're stored externally. But now let's pause what we know and take a look into a possible future. It's 2025. Film companies are making so much money from streaming services that they decide to pull out of making DVDs altogether. Many people are using online streaming services to watch films and TV from home, making DVDs no longer financially viable. Moving on to 2030, 6G is officially introduced. Able to support data transfer rates of up to one terabyte per second, cloud computing and online data transfer rates hit an all-time high, with people using online services more than ever before. Upload and download speeds are now so fast that offices are beginning to use cloud storage companies to store data on their behalf, meaning that all of your data is accessed via the internet and is externally stored. This, this gives companies freedom to buy cheaper computers with less storage and more processing power. Now when we get to 2035, the first phone with no internal storage is released. All your data will be securely stored in one of the many cloud storage facilities across the globe. Without internal storage, this leaves more space for larger and faster processing chips, making it the speediest smartphone on the market. Alongside this, companies are making significant advancements in artificial intelligence technology due to high interconnectivity levels, making it easier for AIs to plug into the internet and learn everything that they can. Then, in 2038, specifically January the 19th at 3.14am, Unix time crashes. Unix time counts the number of seconds that have passed since it was launched at midnight on January the 1st, 1970. It is a method of standardising time so that every computer chip would be able to work out what day it is by checking the Unix time value. Unix time is represented as 32 ones or zeros, or bits. The first bit is signed, which means that it determines whether the number is positive or negative. Currently, it's positive as it's counting upwards from zero. The other 31 bits determine the value of the number of seconds. This means that eventually, Unix time will hit a maximum when all of the bits are ones. Specifically, 2,147,483,647 seconds since January the 1st, 1970, which just so happens to be January the 19th, 2038 at 3.14am. At this moment, the value will max out and the signed bit will flip to say that the number is negative and will display the current time as 8.45pm on December 13th, 1901. This will cause 32-bit systems to crash as they cannot deal with that huge sudden time jump. Thankfully, most of our systems are now built with 64-bit processors, meaning that they can count up to 292.3 billion years into the future. However, all of our older 32-bit systems will struggle to function and could likely become obsolete 
after the 2038 Unix time crash. This means that you might lose access to all your old data that has not been transferred to a new system. Now, a couple of years before that, in 2036, the world's governments launched Project Y2K38, the world's biggest upgrade project ever seen. Embedded 32-bit systems in important infrastructure such as planes, trains, automobiles, communication devices and internet appliances are removed and replaced with 64-bit systems. But this takes so much time and money that devices owned privately by the public are not considered for an upgrade. This means that the 32-bit systems that you own will no longer work after the Unix time crash. Simultaneously, a piece of code is written which will ensure that all working 64-bit systems can successfully switch to the new time measurement. However, due to the high pressure that governments are under, this code is not rigorously tested and so passes the basic checks and is sent out globally for all devices just weeks before the crash date. The basic test failed to, failed to pick up on one key part of the code, which had been added by a corrupted politician who was part of a highly secret hacker group known as AXU. The code allowed them to intercept passwords that were sent over cloud networks completely undetected. AXU were concerned that the day AI becomes as intelligent as humans, then human life will become unnecessary and eventually extinct. This day is known as the singularity and they are, prevent they are determined to prevent the singularity at all costs. One decade passes and it's now 2048. AXU start preparing and practicing. They have been monitoring activity and started to intercept people's personal data. With access to secure cloud networks, they can view people's photos, calendars, banking details and security information, as all of our data is now stored in remote cloud storage facilities. It's not just your data though, data that belongs to governments, secret services, armed forces and stockbrokers. If you can think of it, they probably have access to it. Police forces start to see an increase in ransomware with AXU having the power to hold data hostage until demands are met, from the comfort of their bedrooms. It's 2048, and data is now more valuable than human life. Two years later, and it's 2050, AXU launch a worldwide attack on all the data it can get its virtual hands on. Everyone who tries to access their data is faced with a notification telling them that the issue will be fixed shortly but they won't be able to find the data. AXU has successfully managed to shut down access to nearly every cloud storage facility across the globe. And everything stops. You can't access your photos. You can't contact your friends. You can't access your banking and you can't access your music or any form of entertainment. And you can't do work. Your data is what makes you and you can't access it anymore. So, who are you now? Banks and stock markets collapse. They can't trade anymore. Planes start to fall from the sky. They can't communicate with air traffic control. Trains and cars come to a stop as the whole traffic system defaults to red. TV signals are lost, and loss of communication causes worldwide power systems to fail, as grid systems were all automatic. Everything that needed the internet or electricity to work stops. And in the modern society of 2050, that means everything. The singularity has been prevented, but at what cost? Now, let's pause our story there. You may be thinking, why is he telling us this story? This future collapse has nothing to do with us here and now. And that's where I must tell you that you're wrong. Yes, that story is slightly stretched, but it is feasibly possible. The Unix time crash is not a fictional story. It is going to happen, whether you like it or not, on January the 19th, 2038 at 3.14am. But you don't have to look far into the future to see the story's relevance. Remember at the start of this talk, when I asked you about what you'd bring with you on holiday. With everything we need condensed into our smartphones, 
What happens when the smartphone breaks? You'd be unable to ring anyone and you'd be stranded if you didn't know where you were. Imagine if the internet were to stop working right now. Everything would still fall into chaos. Banks, trading, transport, information exchange, everything would come to a stop. Remember on December 14th, 2020, when Google crashed for a couple of hours? Everyone lost their minds, and so many people temporarily lost access to emails, YouTube, and online learning. People couldn't work properly, and that was only for a couple of hours. But the question is, how can we avoid this issue? Well, the best thing to do is to make sure that we don't let technology take over every aspect of our lives. Sure, a smartphone or laptop might make things simpler and easier, but when that system fails, what do we do? We need to put a pause on our advancements and step back and think about whether we are changing for the better or for the worse. When those systems crash, millions of people who have put their faith in their devices will be stranded. I think it's vital that we don't lose touch with important skills just because technology can do it for us. For example, map reading is an essential skill that we are losing. If you were lost in an unknown place and you didn't have a phone, you'd still be able to find your way if you had a map and were able to read and use it. But because our phones have inbuilt maps, it means that we're losing that all important skill of being able to navigate by ourselves. Another important human ability is memory and information recall. However, with our smartphones able to remember dates and appointments, give us reminders, and 24-7 access to all the information on the internet, it means that our way, of our way of thinking is changing. We are using our phones like external storage for our brains. But if we lost that external storage, then what would we do? We rely on being able to search the internet for information, meaning that we are not using our skill of information retention. Because what's the point in remembering something if you can search for it? Well, if we were to follow this logic, then we would be lost without the internet. And it's this over-reliance which is the root of our problem. The increasing rate of this distractive ability of technology in our devices may also be leading to increased attention deficits, as we are constantly expecting attention from our phones. This may cause us to lose our ability to voluntarily regulate ourselves, which is an essential skill in humans. In 1890, psychologist William James wrote that the faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character and will. Our smartphones are an easy way to give ourselves attention and the manipulation of our minds to want to pick up our phones as often as possible is causing us to lose our freedom of choice. It's also important to highlight that technology doesn't have all of our human skills as well. When you send a message, it's impossible to express the same amount of emotion and subtext than if you had spoken it. And you lose that connection of experiencing someone's body language and word delivery over the internet. With the increasing use of social media to talk to our friends and family, we are losing touch with our ability to convey and read emotions, which is an essential part of life. In the future, will our children be able to tell the difference between emotions if they never speak to someone face to face? Moving over to the industry, we can see that some essential services such as the electricity sector are making sure their systems are internet proof. Some firms are continuing to use manual switches to turn systems on and off, putting a pause on upgrading to the newest tech. This ensures that if automatic computer systems failed, then someone could step in and still physically turn something on or off. We also find that analogue systems help to stimulate our haptic sense, feeling all those different textures and materials of those buttons and dials, as opposed to the smooth glass of a computer screen. And maybe we should be taking inspiration from this in our everyday lives. Yes, the internet will make it easier for us to do something, 
Yes, advancements in technology make it easier for things to be done for us. But just because something is easier, that doesn't necessarily mean it's better. Don't lose touch with your basic skills. Using technology is taking away what it means to be human. Make sure you're not letting your phone control your life. It's easy for us to hand over control of our lives to technology, but think about it. What happens when the technology fails? Thank you.